Chapter 7, Section 3 The Beast from the Earth This beast is presented to our notice, Revelation 13, 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and spake as a serpent. Though this beast is mentioned after the beast from the sea, it does not follow that he came into existence after the sea beast. The work he did seems to show the very contrary, for it is by his instrumentality that mankind are led, verse 12, to worship the first beast, after that beast had received the deadly wound, which shows that he must have been in existence before. The reason that he is mentioned second is just because as he exercises all the powers of the first beast and leads all men to worship him, so he could not properly be described till that beast had first appeared on the stage. Now in ancient Chaldea there was a type also of this, that god was called in Babylon Nebo, in Egypt Nub or Num. In Egypt, especially among the Greek-speaking population, the Egyptian B frequently passed into an M. And among the Romans, Numa, for Numa Pompilius, the great priest-king of the Romans, occupied preciously the position of the Babylon Nebo. Among the Etrurians, from whom the Romans derived the most of their rights, he was called Tages, and of this Tages it is particularly recorded that just as John saw the beasts under consideration come up out of the earth, so Tages was a child suddenly and miraculously born out of a furrow or hole in the ground. In Egypt this god was represented with the head and horns of a ram. In Etruria he seemed to have been represented in a similar way, for there we find a divine and miraculous child exhibited wearing the ram's horn. The name Nevo, the grand distinctive name of this god, signifies the prophet, Nabi in Hebrew, and as such he gave oracles, practiced augury, pretended to miraculous powers, and was an adept in magic. He was a great wonder worker and answered exactly to the terms of the prophecy, when it is said, verse 13, He doeth great wonders and causeth fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men. It was in this very character that the Etrurian Tages was known, for it was he who was said to have taught the Romans augury and all the superstition and wonder working jugglery connected therewith. As in recent times we hear of weeping images and winking Madonnas and innumerable prodigies besides, continually occurring in the Romish church in proof of this papal dogma, or that so was it also in the system of Babylon. There is hardly a form of pious fraud or saintly imposture practiced at this day on the banks of the Tiber that cannot be proved to have had its counterpart on the banks of the Euphrates or in the systems that came from it. Has the image of the Virgin been seen to shed tears? Many a tear was shed by the pagan images. To these tender-hearted idols Lucan alludes, when speaking of the prodigies that occurred during the civil wars, he says, Tears shed by gods, our country's patrons, and sweat from Lares told the city's woes. Virgil also refers to the same when he quotes, The weeping statues did the wars foretell, and holy sweat from brazen idols fell. When in the consulship of Appius Claudius and Marcus Perpenna, Publius Crassus was slain in a battle with Aristonicus, Apollo's statue at Cumae shed tears for four days without intermission. The gods had also their merry moods as well as their weeping fits. If Rome counts it a divine accomplishment for the sacred image of the Madonna to wink, it was surely not less becoming in the sacred image of paganism to relax their features into an occasional grin. Then they did so, we have abundant testimony. Pselus tells us that when the priests put forth their magic powers, then statues laughed and lamps were spontaneously enkindled. When the images made merry, however, they seemed to have inspired other feelings than those of merriment into the breasts of those who beheld them. The theurgists, says Salverti, caused the appearance of the gods in the air in the midst of gaseous vapors disengaged from fire. The Theogis Maximus undoubtedly made use of a secret analogous to this when in the fumes of the incense which he burned before the statue of Hecate, the image was seen to laugh so naturally as to fill the spectators with terror. There were times, however, when different feelings were inspired. Has the image of the Madonna been made to look benignantly upon, upon a favorite worshipper and sent him home assured that his prayer was heard? So did the statues of the Egyptian Isis. They were so framed that the goddess could shake the silver serpent on her forehead and not assent to those who had preferred their petitions in such a way as pleased her. 
We read of Romish saints that showed their miraculous powers by crossing rivers or the sea in most unlikely conveyances. Thus of Saint Raymond it is written that he was transported over the sea on his cloak. Paganism is not a whit behind in this manner, for it is recorded of a Buddhist saint, Sura Acharya, that when he used to visit his flocks west of the Indus, he floated himself across the stream upon his mantle. Nay, the gods and high priests of paganism showed far more buoyancy than even this. There is a holy man at this day in the Church of Rome, somewhere on the continent, who rejoices in the name of Saint Cubertine, who so overflows with spirituality that when he engages in his devotions, there is no keeping his body down to the ground, but spite of all the laws of gravity, it rises several feet into the air. So was it also with the renowned Saint Francis of Assisi, Petrus of Martina and Francis of Macerata, some centuries ago. But both Saint Coubertin and Saint Francis and his fellows are far from being original in this superhuman devotion. The priests and magicians in the Chaldean mysteries anticipated them not merely by centuries, but by thousands of years. Coelius Rodiginus says that according to the Chaldeans, luminous rays emanating from the soul do sometimes divinely penetrate the body, which is then of itself raised above the earth, and that this was the case with Zoroaster. The disciples of Jamblichus asserted that they had often witnessed the same miracle in the case of their master, who when he prayed was raised to the height of ten cubits from the earth. The greatest miracle which Rome pretends to work is when by the repetition of five magic words she professes to bring down the body, blood, soul and divinely of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, to make him really and corporeally present in the sacrament of the altar. The Chaldean priests pretended by their magic spells in like manner to bring down their divinities into their statues so that their real presence should be visibly manifested in them. This they called the making of gods, and from this no doubt comes the blasphemous saying of the popish priests that they have power to create their creator. There is no evidence, so far as I have been able to find, that in the Babylonian system the thin round cake of wafer, who by the way just looks like the sun, like sun worship, the unbloody sacrifice of the mass was ever regarded in any other light than as a symbol, that ever it was held to be changed into the god whom it represented. But yet the doctrine of transubstantiation is clearly of the very essence of magic, which pretended on the pronunciation of a few potent words to change one substance into another, or by a dexterous juggle wholly to remove one substance and to substitute another in its place. Further, the Pope, in the plenitude of his power, assumes the right of wielding the lightnings of Jehovah and of blasting by his fulminations whoever offends him. Kings and whole nations believing in this power have trembled and bowed before him, though fear of being scathed by his spiritual thunders. The priests of paganism assumed the very same power, and to enforce the belief of their spiritual power, they even attempted to bring down the literal lightnings from heaven. Yea, there seems some reason to believe that they actually succeeded and anticipated the splendid discovery of Dr. Franklin. Norma Pompilius is said to have done so with complete success. Tullus Hostilius, his successor, imitating his example, perished in the attempt, himself and his whole family being struck, like Professor Reichmann in recent times, with the lightning he was endeavoring to draw down. Such were the wonder-working powers attributed in the divine word to the beast that was to come up from the earth, and by the old Babylonian type these very powers were all pretended to be exercised. The means appointed for drawing down the lightning were described in the books of the Etrurian Tages. Numa had copied from these books and had left commentaries behind him on the subject, which Talos had misunderstood and hence the catastrophe. Justin Martyr writes, It is remar remarkable that as Mitra was born out of a cave, so the idolatrous nominal Christians of the East represent our Savior as having, in like manner, been born in a cave. See Kitto's Cyclopedia under Bethlehem. There is not the least hint of such a thing in Scripture. Now in remembrance of the birth of the God out of a hole in the earth, the mysteries were frequently celebrated in caves underground. This was the case in Persia, where just as Tages was said to be born out of the ground, Mitra was in like manner fabled to have been produced from a cave in the earth. 
Numa of Rome himself pretended to get all his revelations from the nymph Egeria in a cave. In these caves men were first initiated in the secret mysteries, and by the signs and lying wonders there presented to them they were led back, after the death of Nimrod, to the worship of that god in its new form. This apocalyptic beast, then, that comes up out of the earth, agrees in all respects with that ancient god born from a hole in the ground, for no words could more exactly describe his doing than the words of the prediction, verse 13. He doeth great wonders, and causeth fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. These wonder-working beasts, called Nebo, or the prophet, as the prophet of idolatry, was of course the false prophet. By comparing the passage before us with Revelation 19.20, it will be manifest that this beast that came up out of the earth is expressly called by that very name. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of a beast, and them that worshipped his image. As it was the beast from the earth that wrought miracles before the first beast, this shows that the beast from the earth is the false prophet, in other words, is Nabo. If we examine the history of the Roman Empire, we shall find that here also there is a precise accordance between type and anti-type. When the deadly wound of paganism was healed and the old pagan title of pontiff was restored, it was through means of the corrupt clergy symbolized, as is generally believed, and justly under the image of a beast with horns like a lamb, according to the saying of our Lord, Beware of false prophets that shall come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The clergy as a corporate body consisted of two grand divisions, the regular and secular clergy answering to the two horns or powers of the beast, and combining also at a very early period both temporal and spiritual powers. The bishops as heads of these clergy had large temporal powers long before the Pope gained his temporal crown. We have the distinct evidence of both Guizot and Gibbon to this effect. After showing that before the 5th century the clergy had not only become distinct from, but independent of the people, Guizot adds. The Christian clergy had moreover another and very different source of influence. The bishops and priests became the principal municipal magistrates. If you open the code, either of Theodosius or Justinian, you will find numerous regulations which remit municipal affairs to the clergy and the bishops. Guizot makes several quotations. The following extract from the Justinian Code is sufficient to show how ample was the civil power bestowed upon the bishops. With respect to the yearly affairs of cities, whether they concern the ordinary revenues of the city, either from fundraising or the property of the city, or from private gifts or legacies, or from any other source, whether public works or despots of provisions or aqueducts, or the maintenance of baths or ports, or the construction of walls or towers, or the repairing of bridges or roads, or trials in which the city may be engaged in reference to public or private interest, we ordain as follows. The very pious bishop and three notables, chosen from among the first men of the city, shall meet together, they shall each year examine the works done, they shall take care that those who conduct them or who have conducted them shall regulate them with precision, render their accounts and show that they have duly performed their engagements in the administration, whether of the public monuments or of the sums appointed for provisions or baths, or of expenses in the maintenance of roads, aqueducts or any other work. Here is a large list of functions laid on the spiritual shoulders of the very pious bishop not one of which is even hinted at in the divine enumeration of the duties of a bishop, as contained in the word of God. See 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 7 and Titus 1 5 to 9. How did the bishops who were originally appointed for purely spiritual objects contrive to grasp as such a large amount of temporal power? From Gibbon we get light as to the real origin of what Guizot calls this prodigious power. The author of The Decline and Fall shows that soon after Constantine's time, the church in apostrophe, and consequently the bishops, especially when they assumed to be a separate order from the other clergy, gained great temporal power through the rite of asylum, which had belonged to the pagan temples, being transferred by the emperors to the Christian churches. His words are, the fugitive and even the guilty were permitted to implore either the justice or mercy of the deity and his ministers. 
Thus was the foundation laid of the invasion of the rights of the civil magistrate by ecclesiastics, and thus were they encouraged to grasp at all the powers of the state. Thus also, as is justly observed by the authors of Rome in the 19th century, speaking of the right of asylum, were the altars perverted into protection towards the very crimes they were raised to banish from the world. This is a very striking thing, as showing how the temporal power of the papacy in its very first beginnings was founded on lawlessness, and is an additional proof to the many that might be alleged that the head of the Roman system to whom all bishops are subject is indeed the lawless one. Second Thessalonians 2.8 Predicted in scripture as the recognized head of the mystery of iniquity. All this temporal power came into the hands of men who, while professing to be ministers of Christ and followers of the Lamb, were seeking simply their own aggrandizement, and to secure that aggrandizement did not hesitate to betray the cause which they professed to serve. The spiritual power which they wielded over the souls of men and the secular power which they gained in the affairs of the world were both alike used in opposition to the cause of pure religion and undefiled. At first these false prophets, in leading men astray and seeking to unite paganism and Christianity, wrought underground, mining like the mole and the dog, and secretly perverting the simple according to the saying of Paul, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. But by and by, towards the end of the fourth century, when the minds of men had been pretty well prepared, and the aspect of things seemed to be favorable for it, the wolves in sheep clothing appeared, appeared above the ground, brought their secret doctrines and practices, by little and little into the light of day, and century after century, as their power increased, by means of all deceivableness of unrighteousness and signs of lying wonders, deluded the minds of the worldly Christians, made them believe that their anathema was equivalent to the curse of God, in other words, that they could bring down fire from heaven, and thus cause the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed. Though the Pope be the great Jupiter Tonans of the papacy and Fulminantes from the Vatican, as his predecessor was formerly believed to do from the capital, yet it is not he in reality that brings down the fire from heaven, but his clergy. But for the influence of the clergy in everywhere blinding the minds of the people, the papal thunders would be b b but bruta fulmina after all. The symbol, therefore, is most exact when it attributes the bringing down of the fire from heaven to the beast from the earth rather than to the beast from the sea. When the deadly wound of the pagan beast was healed and the beast from the sea appeared, it is said that this beast from the earth became the recognized accredited executor of the will of the great sea beast, verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, literally in his presence under his inspection. Considering who the first beast is, there is great force in this expression, in his presence. The beast that comes up from the sea is the little horn that has eyes like the eyes of man. Daniel 7.8 It is Janus Tuens, the all-seeing Janus, in other words, the universal bishop or universal overseer, who from his throne on the seven hills, by means of the organized system of the confessional, sees and knows all that is done to be the utmost bounds of his wide dominion. Now it was just exactly about the time that the Pope became universal bishop that the custom began of systematically investing the chief bishops of the Western Empire with a papal livery, the pallium, for the purpose, says Giseler, of symbolizing and strengthening their connection with the Church of Rome. From Giseler we learn that so early as 501 AD the Bishop of Rome had laid the foundation of the corporation of bishops by the bestowal of the pallium but at the same time he expressly states that it was only about 602 AD at the 63 ascent of Phocas to the imperial throne that Phocas that made the Pope universal bishop that the popes began to bestow the pallium that is of course systematically and on a large scale. That pallium worn on the shoulders of the bishops while on the one hand it was the livery of the Pope and bound those who received it to act as the functionaries of Rome, deriving all their authority from him and exercising it under his superintendence, as the bishop of bishops, on the other hand, was in reality the visible investiture of these wolves with the sheep's clothing. For what was the pallium of the papal bishop? It was a dress made of wool, blessed by the Pope, 
taken from the holy lambs kept by the nuns of St. Agnes, and woven by their sacred hands, that it might be bestowed on those whom the popes delighted to honor, for the purpose, as one of themselves expressed it, of joining them to our society in the one pastoral sheepfold. Thus commissioned, thus ordained by the universal bishop, they did their work effectually, and brought the earth and them that dwelt in it to worship the beast that received the wound by a sword and did live. This was a part of this beast's predicted work, but there was another, and not less important, which remains for consideration.